Okay, this is a continuation of the lecture for MAC 1114 Trigonometry, Section 6.5, picking up with Example 7. We continue to look at secant and cosecant graphs, and later in the section we are going to be looking at tan and cotan. So, picking up with Example 7, remember that all the secant and cosecant graphs are really graphed in terms of they're reciprocal graphs. That creates what we call an auxiliary graph. And from there, we open up the parabolic curves as well as the asymptotes. And we did this so that we wouldn't have to learn brand new patterns um, for these particular graphs. That way, you can get everything done for sine, cosine, secant, and cosecant just by knowing uh, two, two patterns. The one for cosine, up middle, down middle, um dum, and the one for sine, mum d middle up middle down so those that'll cover four of the six graphs so we continue um, working with that and so i've done a little bit of the problem here i rewrote the secant in terms of its reciprocal um which is cosine and we're going to do the problem from there using the patterns for there you need not look at the original once you've rewritten it i did the amp which is just absolute value of your A value, which is located right here, and then what comes after the trig word but before the X, that's your B value, and we'll be using that for period. So period is 2 pi divided by the B value, that's the formula we've been using throughout the last two sections for sine, cosine, secant, and cosecant divided by the b value, which is, as I pointed out, 2 pi. So our b value turns out to be 1. And then the jump is always just, that also has a formula. Uh, it's just period divided up into four parts. So if we continue with that down here, it would be jump is equal to the period divided into four parts. So we're going to be numbering our x-axis based on this jump. Okay, this was our period. This is our amp. Okay, next let's do the start point. The start point is when you ask yourself, what number could I plug in for x that would zero out this argument? And that would be zero. Because zero times two pi, or any number, is zero. Then, if you want the y partner that goes with it, well, then you have to evaluate the function at x equal to 0, which would be negative 5 cosine. If we put, again, if we put a 0 right in there, that makes this whole thing cosine of 0. So that's what you would be entering in your calculator, unless you're doing this in your head. Cosine of 0 is 1. 1 times negative 5 is negative 5. But feel free to put that in your calculator, as I stated. Okay, so that's going to be our start point, and remember that start point really has to, is related to uh, the pattern that we're going to use. In fact, the very first letter of the pattern tells you what, lap, uh, what level you're at, middle, upper, downward. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the pattern for cosine is... Uh, let me review with you again how to switch that. This is the typical pattern without a reflection, the original pattern. But notice that we have a negative here, which means we're going to reflect over the x-axis. And we do that by switching the ups to downs and the downs to ups. And then we observe that pattern in order to make the graph flip over the x-axis, or what we call reflect. Okay, so that's the pattern that we're going to be using. Notice that in this pattern, once we reflect, the first letter is D. So related to this start point, this start point is at in the downward position. And I'll just bring that here. So the 0, negative 5, which is the first point that we're going to plot, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That is your absolute lowest level that you're going to be plotting points. 
And then all the other levels can be measured um, from there, as I've shown in previous problems, using the amp. So my amp is 5. That means I'm going to space up 5 units vertically and draw another horizontal shelf. That'll be my middle shelf. Then we're going to space up five from there. One, two, three, four, five. Amping up five again and then showing our upper shelf. Okay, then from there we're going to be plotting points to get the auxiliary graph. But before we can start plotting points, I mean these the upper, middle, and downward shelves will keep us from going too high or too low, but we also need to know how far to slide each time we plot a point. So let's put some numbers on the x-axis. Once again, your jump is one-fourth. And so that's what we're going to be labeling our x, the grid marks on our x-axis. So this will be one-fourth. And you don't have to label every single grid mark just so the numbers don't run into each other. So I'm going to label that one. This would be two-fourths. You're always counting in an increment equivalent to the numerator. So this would be plus one, two fours, plus one, three fours, and so forth. So this will be four fours, this will be five fours, this will be six fours, seven fours, eight fours, nine fours. Okay, and then I'm going to go about that far in the other direction. So I have at least two cycles. So this will be negative two fours, trying to squeeze it in there. The numbers, four fours, five fours, trying to get it right under the grid mark, six fours, seven fours. Uh, eight fourths and negative nine fourths. That should give me enough of a graph. Okay, so then um, again the start point is zero negative five. I've already plotted that and now I begin to plot the points suggested by MUM and then you can come right back around to the front or just look at your picture to get repetitive um, cycles on this graph. Okay, so I'm in the downward position. Now I'm going to go to the middle position and plot a point. So I slide over, go to the middle level, plot a point. Slide over, go to the upper level and plot a point. Slide over, go back down to the middle level because you know you're doing a cosine graph and it just goes up and down like a wave. Never any higher than the upper level, never any lower than the downward level, and always as you pass from up to down or down to up, always stop at the middle to plot a point if you want to stop looking at the pattern. So here we went down, middle, up, back down to the middle again. All of these points are spaced out one fourth, one fourth, there's the next point, one fourth, there's the next point, one fourth. So I'm at the middle, I'm on my way down, slide over one fourth, all the way down. Now I have to travel back up because I can't go any lower than this. So slide over one fourth, back up, stop at the middle before you go all the way to the top. Slide over one fourth and all the way to the top. Keep going. Come down now. Slide over one fourth, back to the middle. Slide over one fourth, all the way down. Slide over one fourth, back up to the middle. And then you can just connect these in the shape that you know to be the cosine. It's just a wave that connects all these points. Okay, then let's get uh, the part that is over on the negative side. I'm down at the bottom. Start climbing back up. Slide over one-fourth. Back up to the middle. Slide over one-fourth. All the way to the top. Slide over one-fourth. Start coming back down. Stopping at the middle first. And then slide over one-fourth. All the way down. Slide over one-fourth. Start to come back up. Stopping at the middle first. Slide over one fourth all the way to the top. Slide over one fourth, come back down. Slide over one fourth all the way down. Slide over one fourth back there and connect your wave, the points that create your wave on the left side.
Okay, then using this as the auxiliary graph, just go through the points that are on the middle level. Those will be your uh, points through which you create your asymptotes. So there's going to be an asymptote right here coming straight down. Vertical asymptotes created at these um, x-intercepts. Now sometimes the middle level is either up here or down here. So whatever the middle level is, look for where the graph intersects the middle level on that horizontal line and draw those vertical asymptotes. Because these are going to hold in your parabolic curves. They will be sandwiched in between these asymptotes. Okay, and then let's see, I'll draw the ones that are over here. So uh, the this wave hits the middle level, intercepts the middle level right here. So this will be another asymptote. Hits it here. Just use up however many I have. Okay. And then you can draw your parabolic curves to finish off the graph. So you have upward parabolas from any of your maximum points. And when they ask you questions about the range, you're looking specifically at these parabolic shapes that open up and down. That is what you're answering the range about. And these are all your downward parabolic shapes. Okay, now you can answer whatever questions they happen to be asking about this picture. Um, on the next page. So the next page is they force you into selecting certain answers and you can refer to your diagram as you do so. So let's see, things that they're going to ask us is to choose the graphs that they have pre-generated in the software, the homework software. Also taking note of where the asymptotes are, those asymptotes, and we'll transfer this information over to the next page or at one-fourth three fours, five fours, seven fours. That's where your asymptotes are here. That's where they're occurring. So right there. So you can get a pattern going and then answer the questions because they give it in the form of a formula, the equation for the asymptotes. Then again, that five fours. So like all odd multiples of one fourth. This is one fourth times one, one fourth times three, um, one fourth times five, and so forth. And all the negative counterparts would be on the other side. So you could say it is one fourth times k, where these k values, these multipliers of the numerator, they are odd integers. So we'll see if they have an answer like that, hopefully, with respect to um, the domain, because domain is when you want to mention where the asymptotes are, because when you're talking about domain, once again, you're talking about the x's, and the asymptotes are dropped at x values that are not allowed. These are x values that are not allowed. And by drawing asymptotes there, we stop anyone who is graphing from actually graphing points on those x values. So it has to be mentioned when you're talking about the domain. You have to mention the asymptotes. Okay. Then as far as what the range is, it's pretty easy to see that these upward par parabolic shapes are at 5 and greater. And these downward parabolic shapes are at negative 5 and below. Okay, so let's answer the questions associated with the homework software. Okay, so the one that looks like ours, and you got to look at some of these carefully because some of them can be close in their appearance. Now, they were saying to do, um, 
two cycles. Look at the kind of numbers we got here. Our period. Remember, period's another name for cycle. So if they told you to do two periods and they're forcing you into the way that they've numbered the x-axis rather than the way we did here, that would mean you're wanting to show a picture that goes from uh, 1 to negative 1. And you can see that we do not have pi symbols on our x-axis right here. So don't pick a picture that has that. So you can rule certain things out right away. Ruled out, ruled out, wrong kind of numbers on the x-axis. Okay, then um, as far as these, which both go from, these both have two cycles or two periods. You could call it either thing. It goes from one to negative one, so is this one. But then you want to look at the positioning of the parabolic curves and compare them to yours. Like, for instance, you had an upward parabola, if you look back at your picture, on the right side of the y-axis and a downward parabola, and let's look at that real quick. This is your y-axis right here. So if this is your y-axis right here. You had a upward parabola directly to the right, um, right after an asymptote though. So there's going to be a little space in there. Upward to the right, downward, um, let's see, that one actually opens right across. This opens right across the y-axis. So that's those are the features you want to look for when you go to choose which one it is. Okay, so that would be this one as opposed to that one. So this is out because the parabolic shapes are not opening in the right um, in the right correct manner. So we have this one opens up at five and one that opens right across that y-axis. So that's choice A. Okay, as far as uh, what is the domain? The domain, you're talking about the asymptotes because those are x value. Domain's a conversation about what can the x's be and what can they not be. The asymptotes are an indication of what they can't be. So we had discussed that they were happening at multiples, not pi multiples. So that's out of there. Not at all real numbers. Otherwise, we wouldn't have asymptotes not at any kind of multiple times pi. It is multiples of one-fourth, where the multiplier, which is what they talking about when they mention k, is an odd integer. So that would be choice d. Okay, the, once again, those asymptotes were happening at one-fourth, three-fourths, um, seven-fourths, etc. Okay, so you can see that these are just all multiples of one-fourth. The top is either being multiplied by the odd integer 1 or by 3 or by 7, and then they just went on from there. Use the graph to talk about the range. That is just where the parabolic curves open from. Okay, so we saw a very, you know, very easily on our graph that they opened uh, negative 5 or less than negative 5, and uh, 5 and greater. Okay, and that was right here on the picture. 5 or greater, negative 5 or less than that. Okay, moving to examples 8, 9, and 10. And now we begin our <coughs> conversation about tangents. So with the tangent function, we will have to uh, use new patterns because there's no auxiliary graph that you can create first related to sine or cosine that's going to help you with this. So you're going to have to memorize um, two new patterns for that. So you have a total of four patterns with respect to sections four and five. But everything else is the same. How to find the amp. Um, how to find the period with the slight exception that now we have come on to the last two graphs that we're going to study, which are tan and cotan. We've already studied sine, cosine, cosecant, and secant. And one thing that is different when it comes to finding the amp and the period and the jump, they're, you know, pretty much all the steps are the same, but the difference with this one is that tangent has a period of pi. The values for the tan function repeat every um, pi unit. So 
in that part where you typically find the period as we have for sine, cosine, tan, um, secant, and cosecant, where we started with 2 pi divided by the b value, well now when you go to find the period for either tan or cotan, your period, unlike the other four graphs, will start off with 1 pi, because that is the period for a parent graph divided by b. Same thing here. Tan and cotan start off with a period of pi, but then altered by whatever the b value is. So that's kind of the only difference um, with uh, the things that, you're, that you typically find for every single problem. Amp, period, jump, start point, all of that will be the same. Period will start off differently, though. Okay, so here are just um, some pictures of the tan and what they look like. You can see here that uh, the pattern, middle up, asymptote down, they're talking about this right here. This is middle. This would be like the start point. Right at the middle, then the next point over, after you figure out how much you're going to slide, next point over would be up. Then the next thing that would happen is not a point, an asymptote. And then the next thing that would happen on the right side of that asymptote would be a downward point. That would be the point closest to the asymptote. So you're going to move in this pattern when you create um, your tangent graphs. Again, we can't do an auxiliary graph. That's just for secant and cosecant to get out of uh, memorizing additional patterns. And the other difference is we're going to start off with a different base period. Okay, notice that... These move in completely opposite direction. These kind of graphs are said to have origin symmetry, and that's because um, you could take the objects or the images that you're seeing in quad one, rotate them 180 degrees, and they would superimpose on the images that are in the third quadrant so that when you have images that can be superimposed by a 180 degree rotation that's origin symmetry. Okay so both of these graphs have origin symmetry. Now this one is an increasing um, graph. If you slide this way, if you look at the graph moving this way and you're traveling along the curve the y values are increasing whereas this graph is called decreasing. Again, whenever you observe a graph to say whether it's increasing or decreasing, you slide left to right, but traveling along the curve. So if you move to this way and you traveled along your curve, the y values would be going down, down, down. So this is a decreasing graph, whereas this is an increasing graph. Um, let's see, what else? The asymptotes here, you can see they're occurring at multiples of pi over 2, and those numerators are odd integers. This is a numerator in front of the pi of 1, this is a numerator of 3, next one would be 5 pi over 2, and then all the same negative counterparts. Okay, the difference with this one is that the asymptotes here fall at multiples of pi. So you would have 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so forth. Now we're, the, the, for us, the asymptotes are going to emerge as um, part of the patterns that we're using. So if you learn how to use those patterns properly, you will get the asymptotes exactly where they need to be, regardless of whether the graph has been shifted by um, a vertical or a, a vertical shift or a phase shift. Okay, so let's get started with the tan and the cotan graphs. Okay, first just a few basic questions based on the background that I have given you here on the shape of the tan graph. Climbs upward and to the right, and this graph climbs from the left downward, opposite direction of this one. And so knowing that will help you to have a sense of how to connect the dots when you start um, creating your own patterns or when you start creating your own graphs. Okay, the pattern for this, tangent, middle up, middle down, you're going to need to memorize that. Pattern for this one, asymptote up, middle down. 
Okay, and we'll write that when we go to do the graphs. Okay, here we go. Okay, start answering a couple questions. So number eight, the graph of y is equal to um, tan of x is symmetric with respect to the origin. And I gave a little uh, verbal conversation on the fact that you could take the images in quad one, rotate them 180 degrees, and superimpose on the images in third quadrant. So this has origin symmetry. You don't have like images on either side of the y-axis like, we like we've had with the, um, some of the other graphs that we looked at in this section. Okay, so now what else are we being asked here? And vertical asymptotes at odd multiples of pi over 2, 1 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. So odd multiples of pi over 2. Example 9. Decide whether the following statement is true or false. The tan, cotan, secant, and cosecant, all graphs that have asymptotes, have infinitely many asymptotes. Yes, they, that's true, because these graphs go on and on in the positive infinity direction, as well as on and on in the negative infinity direction. So this is true. It's just that they're only showing you... Um, a specific portion of the graph so you can get a sense of the patterns that happen for that particular graph, but they're not going to go on and on with the graph. Example 10. What is the y-intercept of y equal to tangent of x? So go look at the tan graph and see where it hits the y-axis. That's what a y-intercept is. So if you look at that parent tan graph, it hits the y-axis right at zero. The answer to that would be zero. Okay, moving to example 11. I believe we start graphing again, but now you're going to explore the use of the new patterns that you learned for tan and cotan and the new period. Okay, but much, most of it will uh, be the same. You're going to start off with AMP. The amp here is just 1, because there's a 1 right out here. That's your A value. This is still your B value, right after the trig word, but right before the X. So amp is 1. Okay, period. Forget the period for tan or cotan starts with pi, then divided by the B value. So it's 1 pi divided by this b value, pi over 2. You have a complex fraction here, so float that divisor up to the top and flip it over so that it becomes a multiplier. So this is no longer here. The pi's cancel, leaving you with 2. So that's your period. The jump is always all six graphs that you learned. The period divided into four parts so that you can apply it to the four points in each of the patterns. Okay, so this is going to be the period divided by four. So our jump is going to be one half. Okay, then uh, next thing that we're going to do is the start point. And the start point for this particular problem, remember the start point every time you're doing it, is just what you think of what the values that you could plug in for x that would cause this argument to zero out. And in every graph we've done, it has been, ze it has been zero. Not that there aren't other kind of graphs that you could be led to actually get involved in, but with what we're doing, that's how it's been. So when we go to do the start point here, the value that would cause a zero in the argument is zero, and then you evaluate to get the y partner, this y partner right here, by just observing what is y if we put a zero in right there. Well, if you put a zero in right there, zero times pi over two would just be zero. So that's all we want to know is what is the tan at zero. And if you, you can always get help with this part by just putting it in your calculator. Just tan of zero, there you go, zero.
or you know some people draw their own unit circle and do it in um, by hand they just do it in their head so tan zero zero that's going to be our start point don't forget your start point is related exactly to the pattern the pattern for any kind of tan function and there's no reflection here so I'm not going to be switching anything um, <clears throat> the pattern for this is M for middle U for up A for asymptote so now you have patterns that have A's in them rather than just U's and D's and M's and D for down this is the pattern Okay, this very first letter implies where what the start point is doing, what the starting position is doing. Sometimes the starting position when you're doing a cotangent function is an, an actual asymptote, and so we can just call it the starting position rather than the starting point. But this happens to be a point. We do have a letter that signifies that that point is at the middle level. So right there, we know that this is the middle. Okay, then if we know where even one of the levels is, that tells us where the other two are just by using the amp. Now I'm going to let two marks stand for the number one just so it's not so scrunched together. I mean, sometimes you can't help scrunching it together. Then I'm also going to lay... Um, some numbers out along the x-axis. Try to draw a little bit nicer. Got to be pretty precise here to get a nice picture. Okay, so we have our upward, middle, and downward levels. And then um, let's put some numbers along the x-axis. Our jump turned out to be 1 half. So you can start labeling that way. So on my x-axis, this is 1 half. This would be 2 halves, 3 halves, 4 halves. Just trying to conserve some room here so I'm not putting putting the numbers on every single grid mark, but they're still there. One half, two halves, three halves, four halves, five halves, six halves, seven halves, eight halves, nine halves. So I'll go that far just so I can get a nice graph. And um, over here, I'll do the same thing. So negative one half, negative two halves, negative three halves, four halves, five halves, Six halves, seven halves, eight halves, nine halves. Okay, so I'm all numbered up there. And now I'm going to look for um, the rest of the pattern to give me, you know, the rest of the graph. So I already did zero, zero at the middle level. Now I'm going to pull out a point at the upper level, always sliding over whatever the jump is, which I've already established on this x-axis. So, um... Slide over one half, and according to this pattern, we go to the upper level. Whenever you're going to the upper or downward levels, you're plotting a point. If it says A, then you're doing, drawing an, a vertical asymptote. So slide over uh, one half, go to the upper level, plot a point. Slide over one half, and it says that the next thing you should do is drop an asymptote. So let's drop an asymptote instead of plotting a point. And then slide over one half. Next thing you should do is draw a point at the downward level. Okay, ran out of letters. Come back to the front and start all over again. Slide over one half. Draw a point at the middle level. Slide over um, one half. Draw a point at the upper level. Slide over one half. Draw an asymptote. Okay, now I don't believe we're going to have to look at that pattern anymore because the picture is also shows the pattern. This tangent graph has a shape like this where the y values increase. So if you are familiar with the shape that helps you to connect these points without going nutty. 
So right in there, that's one of your waves. And then you can mimic what's going on in between these two asymptotes. You can mimic what is happening there. Okay, notice that uh, the point, there's one point that's up here, then in the middle at the midpoint, it's right at the middle level, and then it comes down. So there's one above at the upper level to the right and above, and then to the left and down. And you can just mimic that in each of these um, other sections that you create. Look, here's the middle, the point that is to the right and above it, and then move slide over and you have a point that is to the left and below it. And then they're squeezed in. These three points are squeezed in by the asymptote. Everything is spaced out with respect to the jump of one half. So whether you plot another point or whether you drop another asymptote, you're always sliding over one half, just like what I did right now. I slid over one half, plotted a point at the downward level. Slide over one half, draw that asymptote that holds the entire way within a compartmentalized region of this graphing grid. So there you have another wave right there. And you can draw one more. Okay, so basically closest to the asymptote, so one uh, a jump of one half away, you have a point that's at the upper level. Slide over one half, you have a point at the middle level. Slide at the middle level. Slide over one half, you have a point at the downward level. Slide over one half, you have an asymptote. So you're just repeating the pattern of how that wave is created and how the asymptotes box those in. Okay, I'm gonna stop here on this graph. And then we're going to answer some questions based on um, this nice graph that we created on the next page. So now you're looking at the kind of questions that the software is going to ask with respect to these graphs, but still learning how to graph them by hand. Okay, so let's see. They're going to ask you to pick out the graph, and you can just look at the graph and pick out, look, use features like uh, the direction that the waves open in, the fact that it goes through zero, zero. You can pick it by the asymptotes. You know, if there's a couple of graphs that are too close, we can always look at that kind of stuff. Um, they're going to ask you about um, the domain. And when you start getting asked about the domain, you need to be able to have a conversation about where the asymptotes are. So these asymptotes, let's see where they're happening. They're happening at 2 over 2, or in other words, 1. They're happening at, let's see, this one's at 2 over 2. This one is at 6 over 2. And I'll write them both ways just in case they give you the formula in halves. There's one at 2 over 2, or in other words, 1. There's one at uh, 6 over 2, because in between 5 and 7, it's 6 over 2. Or in other words, 3. There's one at, um, let's see, where else? We can go just by that. That there's one at 1, there's one at 3, and they would go on and on and on don't want to draw any more of this. There'd be another one at, at five. You can already see the pattern here. So like if you were to go all the way to um, 10 over two, there'd be another asymptote there, but we're not going to draw any more of this. That should be enough. Let's go answer these questions. Okay, so remember we had um, a graph that went right through zero, zero. That helps us a little bit, but um, not all the way because there's several graphs here that go in the same direction as the graph that we drew and they go through zero, zero. The only one that we can just cross out right now is that one because that moves in a cotangent direction. The cotangent moves like that. All right, then let's start examining these more closely. First of all, you were supposed to do two cycles. Let's see what our period is because we can sometimes rule out um, answers that we're being forced into just in that manner. 
Our period turned out to be two. That's the same thing as a cycle. So that means you're going two to the right and negative two when you move to the left. So any of these answers um, where you're Look, where you're looking at the x-axis, notice that two of them have pi-type numbers on them. They're out of the question. You did not have pi-type numbers on your x-axis. So if you go two cycles to the right, that would be two and then another two. And then um, likewise over here on the left-hand side. Okay, so that would have to be this choice right here. And then your asymptotes you had um, an asymptote to the right, an asymptote to the left, and these asymptotes were going right through 1, and this is negative 1. Because if that's negative 4, or you can look on the positive side also, if this is 4, this has to be 1, 2, 3, 4. So these asymptotes are happening exactly where they're supposed to be. We had looked at the asymptotes on the pre previous page where we did our our handmade graph and they were happening at 1 and 3 and they're happening at negative 1 and negative 3 over here. So C is the graph. Okay, domain. Um, let's see, so all real numbers, definitely not. Um, the number 1 multiplied by any number that's an odd integer. So 1, 3, 5, so that would be choice B. Those were the kind of asymptotes that we discussed on the previous page, that we had asymptotes at 1. Well, 1 times 1, just as long as you're plugging in a odd integer for k, you're going to get where the asymptotes were. If you plug in the number 3, that's an odd integer, you get 3. If you plug in 5, you get 5 and so forth. So you can understand these formulas. Um, Use the graph to determine the range. Well, both the tan and the cotan, they go up to positive infinity and down to negative infinity. There's just no stopping how high and how low they go. So the range for any of these graphs is going to be all real numbers. Okay, moving to the next graph. We have cotangent of 1 ninth. Okay, and then we're going to be doing the amp first, which is this one right out here. That's your A value right there. This is your B value. So the amp is just 1. The period for both tan and cotan starts with pi, then divided by the B value. So in this particular case, it's 1 pi divided by 1 ninth, and you float this divisor to the top and flip it over in order to simplify it. So instead of dividing by 1 ninth, multiplying by the reciprocal of this divisor is equivalent to that. So 9 times pi is 9 pi. And then your jump would just be that period, as it always is, divided into four parts. So in this particular case your jump is 9 pi over 4. Alright. Alright, then we're going to do start point. Start point is what number zeroes that out? 0. Then in order to get the y partner, just a little bit more room here, you just plug in this value. So if you plug in that value right there, you would just have cotan of 0. Okay, and then uh, for cotan of 0, that's the same. You could put it in your calculator if you want to, but you already know what's going to happen when you go to plug this into the calculator if you don't want to plug it in. 
is look at the pattern we're supposed to be using for cotan. Look at how the very first letter is A for asymptote. And asymptotes only happen when a particular value is undefined, such as the one that we're going to put in right now. We're going to put in zero. What happens to the y value of that part? Because the y value that I seek is equal to this cotan of zero, which if you wanted to press it in your calculator, you could just press it in like this because you don't have a cotan key, so you could just go 1 divided by tan of 0. That's equivalent to cotan. 1 over tan is cotan, and then you put whatever number you're evaluating it at, which was 0. So notice that when you try to get your calculator to evaluate it, it can't do it because it's undefined. So it makes sense. Can't actually put a number here. There is no number. That it's equivalent to. This is the value of this is undefined, and that is why there's an asymptote there. So when you see that you're trying to do your start point, if that's the case for the first letter, you already know what this value is going to come out to be, but you're welcome to put it in the calculator, which I did. Okay, so um, at the starting position, just go to zero and draw what we draw when the value is undefined, which is an asymptote. So go to zero on the x-axis, and right here you are going to have an asymptote. Okay, now usually the starting point that we plot is a point. It's usually a point. In this case, it's an asymptote. So if it was a point, we could just plot that point draw a horizontal line through it, and know what level we're at so that we could put the other levels in place. But just having a line as our starting position doesn't give us that same kind of information. So now you have to think a little bit deeper. Notice that this particular um, function, and I have made mention of this a few times, I don't know if you caught on to it, but whenever there's no vertical shift, the middle level, the middle level is always the x-axis, and that's been true of any of the problems that we've done. When there's a vertical shift, that middle level got shifted um, up if it was a positive vertical shift, and if there was a negative vertical shift, that middle level would get yanked down. So because there is no vertical shift here, And we can't use our start point to indicate what level we're at, because what point are we going to stand on? This one? This one? This one? That would give us different answers each time. So again, you have to think a little bit deeper. When there's no vertical shift, the middle level is automatically the x-axis. When there is a vertical shift, the shift either up, it shifts the middle level up, or it yanks it down. So the middle level is automatically the x-axis. And again, by knowing where just one level is, that allows you to put the other ones in place. So let's see. Now we're going to be amping up one and down one, and that's going to be um, pretty crunched in. So I think I'm just going to go up two at least. And I'm going to let that be 1, and I'll let this be negative 1. So this will be the upper level. This will be the down level. Okay. Good stuff. Let me get a pencil that works. All right, so then, um, so we talked about our start point being um, an asymptote, so now we're ready to act out upper, middle, downward. All right, so standing on this starting position, the asymptote, and I need some numbers here, like I usually do, so a lot to write here, so I might have to write them out here just so they're a little bit clearer, but we're going to be counting in force and the numerator will jump in increments of nine. Okay, so this will be nine pi over four. I'm going to write that here just because it's not going to be that clear because of the grid marks. 
So the grid marks go like this. 9 pi over 4. We're, they're all force, but the top, the numerator, everything's force here. But we're jumping in increments of 9 pi. So 9 times 2, 18. 9 times 3, 27. 9 times 4, 36. 9 times 5, 45, and so on. That's how these grid marks are labeled, but it's a lot to try and squeeze in here. So I can try to write it in, but um, here I've written it for you more clearly. So this would have been the 18. This would be the 27 force, everything with a pi. This next one would have been the 36. Then this would be uh, 45. So it's 9 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9 times 6, 9 times 7, 9 times 7 so forth. So 9 times um, 5, 6, 7, I can put the 7 right here. Okay, and then you'd have the same thing over here. 9 pi over 4, but negative. I'll skip one, then I'll do the next one, which would be negative 27 pi over 4. Just all the negative counterparts of this, which I listed them here. And then this would be um, negative 45 if I skip over one. Fifty four, and then this would be negative sixty three pi over four. Okay, so that helps us jump properly each time we are jumping nine pi, nine fourths pi. All right, so let's see. Um, once again, we had done the asymptote as our starting position. It just happened to be an asymptote rather than a point. And now I'm going to go do the rest of them. So I'm going to slide over 9 fourths, which is my jump. That's my jump. So I'm going to slide over 9 fourths. And I'm going to do what the pattern says, which is to plot a point in the upward position. So 9 fourths, point at the upward position, slide over 9 fourths every time you do anything in the pattern, whether it's an asymptote or a point. Slide over again, now draw a point at the middle position. Slide over uh, 9 fourths, 9 pi over fourth, and do a point at the downward position. Ran out of letters, come back to the beginning of the pattern. Slide over 1 fourth, and this time rather than plot a point, draw an asymptote. Okay, and here you can see the wave. This is the part, remember, this wave moves in the opposite direction as tangent. Goes up on the left, down on the right. And if you don't want to look at this pattern anymore, you could just mimic those moves that sandwiched in between each of the asymptotes. Um, there is up on the left, down on the right, midpoint in the middle before you see another pair, another asymptote. So you could do the same thing over here. You could go slide over. Remember, you're always sliding over um, whatever the jump is, which is 9 pi over 4, every time you do anything, plot a point or do an asymptote. So you would slide over a fourth, you'd have your uppermost point. Slide over a fourth, you'd have your middle point. Slide over a fourth, you'd have your lowest point so that it's up on the left, down on the right. Slide over a fourth, close in that, close in with another asymptote. Close in that wave. So here is the upward part of your wave. Here is the downward part of your wave. Okay, and you can do one more over here. If you're going to do one over here, you'd have the 
downward part of the wave and the upward part of the wave. So slide over one fourth and plot a point all the way down here. Slide over one fourth, draw a point at the middle. Slide over one fourth, draw your upward point so that it goes up on the left, down on the right. Slide over one fourth and close in this wave with an asymptote. So slide over one fourth. Goes up on the left, down on the right. Okay? <clears throat> so you have a picture of a cotangent graph. Okay, now let's see what we can look at as far as the asymptotes because they're going to ask about that when we go to the domain. As far as the graph goes, we can just compare our picture and the fact that they asked for two cycles, which is really just the period. And so the cycles have to do with 9 pi, <clears throat> the period. The domain has to do with the asymptotes. So where are these asymptotes happening? You can see on our graph that we had an asymptote at 0. <clears throat> we had an asymptote right here. And the number that was happening right there was 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 times um, 9, this would have been the 36 pi over 4. <clears throat> because these are all increments of 9. So 9 times 1, 9 times 2, 9 times 3, 9 times 4, which is 36 pi over 4. That's the same thing as 9 pi. So we had an asymptote at 0. We have an asymptote at 9 pi. Here's another one over here. <clears throat> just so we can kind of get into the equations that they use to describe the asymptotes. And this one was at um, 60, this one was at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That would be 8 times 9 pi, 72 pi over 4. Let's see what 72 um, divided by 4 simplifies to 72 um, divided by 4 is 18 pi. Okay, so that's some pretty good information about our asymptotes. They happen on the right hand side, positive side, at 0, 9 pi, 18 pi, because that can help us. Uh, to pick out the correct graph when you have two graphs that are very, very similar. So it's good to have all this, these pieces of information and also to pick out the, do, the proper domain and the formulas that they like to describe the domain, the asymptotes with. <clears throat> all right, so for this particular graph, now look at the choices that you have. Remember we were doing the cotangent. So the cotangent has to move in this direction. See how it climbs upward to the left? So you have three like that. This can't possibly be an answer because those waves do not move in a cotangent direction. Also, um, remember that the period was uh, 9 pi. So if you go um, two cycles this way, it would be 9 pi and 9 pi, 18 pi. Whereas look at what these are doing. This is going to 2 pi and negative 2 pi. That'd be like saying the period is 1 pi, and it definitely wasn't. Because that would be two cycles by the time you get to 2 pi. So it can't be this one or this one. Now just make sure that this is um, the right kind of asymptotes and everything, but it has to be the answer because the other two are ruled out. This has the proper number of cycles based on the period that we found. One period is equal to a cycle, which was 9 pi. So it shows two cycles here, two cycles there. And um, it opens in the correct direction. We had a wave directly to the right of the y-axis and one to the left. And the asymptotes are, look where they are. If that's 18 pi, this is halfway there. We did have an asymptote at 9 pi, so everything fits here. And so choice D. Okay, use the graph to determine the domain. Well, as we were talking about, 
on the previous page. <coughs> the asymptotes were at zero. Okay, that would be this answer here. Multiples of 9 pi, where k is any integer. You can multiply this k by 1 and get 9 pi. You can multiply it by 2 and get 18 pi. So they're not odd integers. <coughs> Excuse me. And then as far as the range goes, the... <coughs> The y values go as high as positive infinity and as low as negative infinity. So the range is all real numbers. Okay, I'll take a little break for a minute. I'll be right back. Okay, so moving on to example 13, we have a little bit more of a complicated um, tangent function. This will be our last graph, I believe. Yep, this is the last one. Okay, so let's finish this off. All right, so we have a tan, so we're going to be using middle up asymptote down as the pattern, but let's start just as we have by recognizing the amp. Then doing the period, which is 1 pi divided by the B value. In this case, the B value is right there. This was our A value. So 1 pi divided by the B value. And then you simplify this by just floating this up to the top multiplying by the reciprocal. So 5 times pi, 5 pi. That's our period. <clears throat> and then the jump. The jump is going to be the period always divided into four parts. <clears throat> so our jump is 5 pi over 4. Then we're going to look at our start point. And our start point is, what do you plug in there to create, to zero out this argument, which would be zero. And then if you want the y value that goes with this, then you just plug in this value into your calculator, although you can do it by hand, and see what you get when you plug in a zero there. So you, you want the y value containing all of this, one third, tan of, we're plugging in a zero right there, so that would be zero times one-fifth, zero plus five. And again, you can just put that right in your calculator. So it would be one divided by three as the coefficient times tan evaluated at zero plus five. And the answer is five. So the y partner is, that goes with 0, is 5. Don't forget, the starting point always is related to the first letter of the pattern that you're using. So the pattern for um, tangent is middle up, asymptote down. 
Okay, since we actually do have a point to plot this time rather than starting with an asymptote as we did in the last problem, this start point is at the position suggested by the first letter. It's a theme that I've been trying to point out every single time we did a graph. Okay, so we're going to go to 0, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And that level right there is the middle level. That means there's one higher than that and there's one lower than that. Okay, so how much higher are we going to go than that? Now, I've already called each of these grid marks um, 1, if I'm calling this 5. So this is, I'm going to have to continue with that convention. So we are moving up only one third in order to show 5 and one third. So it's just going to be a hair above where we're at right now. That'll be my upper level. And then just a little bit below that, another third will bring you down to the lower level. So pretty darn close together. But I think we can do it. All right, so let's continue graphing now. So we need some numbers on this x-axis that can help us judge how far to slide over every time we do one of these actions, upper asymptote and um, downward. So let's label the x-axis. Um, I'm going to have to write a little bit of what I'm labeling the um, grid marks because I won't be able to fit all of this in. It won't be clear, I don't think. So I'll write it on the side as well. All right, so if the jump is 5 fourths, that means that this is going to be, I'll try to write it as clear as I can. So over on the right-hand side, positive side, it would be 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, jumping in increments of 5 pi. But the, all of the denominators will be 4. So 5 pi, 10 pi, 15 pi. So that every single time you are sliding over 5 fourths. This is just an additional 5 fourths, additional 5 fourths pi, and so on. And then the next one would be 20. Next one would be 25. Next one would be 30. And they would just go on and on and on. Okay, so I can only label... Uh, so many of them here. Let's try to not make that so wide. So that would be 5 fourths. Okay, that would be 10 fourths. This would be 15. That would be 20 fourths. 25 fourths. 30 fourths. 35 fourths, 40, and so on. And then you can, you know, number some of these over here. But now we've got the negatives on top of it. 10 fourths, 15 fourths. Twenty fourths. <clears throat> 30, 35, 40, 45, so we can get enough of a graph. Okay, so now we have numbers along the x-axis to guide us in our horizontal sliding as we go and try and plot either a point or drop an asymptote. So we already took care of this starting point, which was at the middle position. Now we're moving on to this. When we run out of letters, we can come back to the front, or we can just look at our diagram to get other shapes, um, the other portions of the graph. Okay, so we're going from this starting point of 0, 5, 
We're going to slide over 5 fourths, which is just what one of these grid marks stand for, and we're going to go to the upper position. So slide over 1 fourth, plot a point at the upper level. Slide over 1 fourth, drop an asymptote. Okay, slide over 1 fourth again. Now plot a point at the downward level. Slide over 1 fourth, point at the downward level. These levels are all so close together, but we'll do it. Okay, keep going. Let's just keep going so we can see what's emerging here. Okay, so after I did the downward level, go back to the front, recycle this saying if you'd like. So it's um, slide over one fourth. We're going to do a point at the middle level. Slide over one fourth. Do one at the upper level. Slide over one fourth. Do an asymptote. Now you can see a complete wave contained with, within uh, two asymptotes. This is the portion that goes up connecting from the middle right through that point that is slightly above it. And this is the portion that goes down. Okay, so now, once you do have a complete wave like this sandwiched in between the two asymptotes, you can just mimic what you were seeing in the inside of the other asymptote areas. So if you want to keep going this way, um, remember that if you're moving this way, you're going to do your downward point, your middle, then your upper. So slide over one um, fourth, do a point at the lowest level, slide over one fourth, do a point at the middle level, level, slide over one fourth, do a point at the upper level, and then slide over one fourth and close in that wave again with an asymptote. Okay, here is your the upward portion of your wave, here is the downward portion of your wave. And you can even do one over here. Only if you're going this way, you're doing the upward portion first. So upper, middle, slide over one fourth, all the way down, slide over one fourth, close in that wave. The way once you plot the three points, you have the wave, and then it's time to close it in. And you can do it again. You could come over here and you could go um, slide over one fourth, point at the uppermost level. Slide over one fourth, point at the middle level. Slide over one fourth, lowest level. Slide over one fourth, close it in. <clears throat> okay, and there's all your nice waves. Here's your asymptotes. All right. Okay, so what do we have here? We talked about the grid marks. Um, we're going to be asked uh, domain. So you need to look at where these asymptotes are. And these asymptotes just happen to hit at <clears throat> 10 fourths. We can reduce those. This reduces to 5 halves. Then the next one was at, uh, let's see, we had one at 10 fourths on the right. Then this one was at <clears throat> 30 fourths. And if we reduce that, that would be just because sometimes, you know, when they give you the formulas for the asymptotes, they oftentimes reduce. Okay, so we had one at um, 10 fourths, 30 fourths, 45. That would have been, uh, we're jumping in increments of 5 here, so that would have been 50. <clears throat> And then by the time you reduce that, that would be 
25 halves. This would be, let's see, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. <clears throat> okay, so just looking at these, um, it looks like if you multiply 5 halves by 1, you would get this one. If you multiply it by the next odd integer, you would get um, 15. So the formula is probably going to be like this. 5 halves pi times a multiplier, and that multiplier has to be odd numbers. If you, mul if you put a 1 right in here, you're going to get that 5 halves right there. If you put uh, the next odd integer, if you put a 3 there, you'll get the 15 halves, which was the next asymptote. If you put the next odd integer, 5, right in there, you would have that 25. So that would be a formula for the asymptotes. All right, so let's go pick what we have here. Take a look at this picture. Notice that this wave, there's a wave splitting right across the y-axis and we have the upward portion on the right, downward portion at the left. Of course the most significant feature is that that turning point is right up there at 0, 5, but you're probably going to have more than one choice where that's going on. Uh, you might want to you know, look at the period in order to rule out certain graphs that they're giving you. They did ask you to do two cycles or two periods, same thing. So it should um, have to do with probably going out to 10 pi on the right and negative 10 pi on the left, so just things like that. Okay, so let's look at the graphs that we have here. First off, you've got to make sure that it's going in the right direction. All the tan graphs go like this. They climb upward on the right and then they fall down on the left of their turning points, and so this one is not even going in the right direction. That's more like a, that's a cotangent shape. All right, so now looking at this, uh, one of the things you might want to rule out, and I don't know if we can, we really actually can't this time. The period was 5 pi. See, that was the period that we got right there, 5 pi, which means two cycles would have been out to 10 pi over to negative 10 pi. However, we have three options that all have that. Um, let's see. Uh, we can look at things like where does it open from? Like, for instance, let's see. That splits across the y-axis. This one's no good. We can rule this one out because it doesn't have a... It has waves that are completely on the right, completely on the left, instead of having part of it on the right, part of it on the left. So there's no splitting of a wave across the y-axis. So we can take that one out of the mix. Um... Furthermore, let's see, we might have to narrow it down by the asymptotes. This opens at 0, 5. This one opens at 0, 5, which you can tell because this is 20, so this has to be 5, 10, 15, 20. So these both open at 0, 5. Can't tell from that, um, but we could maybe look at the asymptotes. And so our asymptotes, once again, were at 5 halves pi, and you can even turn these to decimals, or you can just, you know, you can sometimes, you know, depending on how good you are with fractions, you can tell whether they're hitting at 5 halves pi, 15 pi, but these were our asymptotes, 5, 15, 25. Let's transfer that over here. To get an idea of what these asymptotes looked like. Okay, so let's see where we have two options that we're trying to choose from. And uh, when we look at these, um, our asymptotes were, this would be 2.5, this would be 7.5. Let's see where these asymptotes are. Um, this is going to be 5 pi. And this looks like it's halfway there. So that would half of that that mark right there is at five pi. So this would have to be half of that, two point five pi. So this one's got an asymptote at two point five pi. This is five pi. 
that looks like 7.5 pi to me, which is what these numbers are. This is 2.5 pi. This is 15 divided by 2 is 7.5 pi. They don't go much further than that. So this one appears um, to be correct. And let's look at the asymptotes for uh, choice D. I mean, for choice A, we, this is what we were looking at. This one looks like it's good. Um, here, oh, let's see, what is different about these two? Okay, the asymptotes, let's see if these are different. This looks like it opens at the halfway mark. And this looks like it's at about 7.5 pi. So let's see. Go pick the other two answers first. Those look pretty darn close. Um, all right, so the asymptotes here use the graph to determine the domain of one third tan. Okay, so here when we look at the domain, it says k is an odd integer. We know that we were they were multiples of five halves pi. So the answers here would be odd integer, can't be that, can't be that, can't be that. So it would be this one right here, 5 halves pi. Okay. And then as far as... Um, the range goes, this is the range, the range is just all real numbers, and as far as the graphs go here, this just has, looks like, this turning point just looks like too low. Ours look more like this, so this has all the features that it needs to have because this is at 2.5 pi. And this one's at 7.5 pi. I'm talking about these asymptotes right here. It's just the shape here looks more like what we got because it was very um, scrunched in up there at the top instead of stretched out like this, vertically stretched out like that. So I believe it is this one. It is choice A. Okay, I believe we picked all answers for that particular graph. That one was a little bit more involved. Kind of crazy numbers in that one, but that would be the hardest of the tangent graphs. Okay, that gives you a nice thorough presentation of everything that you're going to see in the um, homework software. Okay, that concludes um, the second video for section 6.5.